Hi, I'm Guy Powell, and welcome to the next episode of The Backstory on the Shroud of Turin. If you haven't already done so, please visit GuyPowell.com and sign up for more episodes. I am the author of the upcoming book, The Only Witness. It's a historical fiction tracing a possible history of the Shroud over the last two millennia. Today, we're speaking with Bill Meacham. He's a synonologist who has been involved in the Shroud for a long time and has written a number of books and, and done a lot of research. Let me give you his background and his bio. He was born in Nashville, Tennessee, and was educated at Tulane University in New Orleans, the Sorbonne in Paris, and the Gregorian University of Rome. He's lived in Hong Kong since 1970, first as a short-term United Methodist missionary, teaching English, and later holding positions as an archaeologist at the Hong Kong Museum of History and the Christian Study Center on Chinese Religion and Culture. He was editor of the Hong Kong Archaeological Society from 1973 to 1985 and chairman from 1985 to 1996. From 1980 to 2012, he was honorary research fellow at the Center of Asian Studies at the Hong Kong University. And since 2012, he's worked on various research projects and has published several interesting books. So Bill, welcome and so good to have you. Well, pleasure to be here, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. So tell us your backstory on getting involved in the Shroud of Turin. Well, it, it, it happened in 1981 out of the blue. You know, I'd been, I'd, I'd studied in Rome for a year and in Paris for a year and never really came across the Shroud at all, not even a mention of it, strangely enough. And I was in a pontifical university in Rome, but I was doing early church history and archaeology uh, and some Roman archaeology. Um, in 1981, I was sitting in the office of the Archaeological Society in uh, Kowloon, and th the magazines that we are subscribed to usually come in one by one. So this, uh, on this day, Archaeology magazine came in, and I was browsing through it, and I saw an article by Pelicurian Evans entitled The Shroud Under the Microscope. And so I thought, hmm, what's this? And it had a big picture of the Shroud of Honey cloth in Italy with an image of Jesus on it. I almost flipped it past it, but I started to read like the first paragraph, and that hooked me on what exactly they were doing there. By the time I got to the end of the article, I was really puzzled. I said, what is this? Because that article in a nutshell, to me, raised a lot of questions like, how, how did this image get there if they couldn't find any, any substance to it? What is this image? So I started digging into this a little bit about uh, Ian Wilson's book, which fascinated me, and then uh, some, a couple of other magazines, and I started writing letters to various people. In those days, of course, there was no internet. I didn't even have a computer back then. Well, way back, 81, 82. And people would send me stuff, and the more I got, the more I read on it, the more I really got more and more hooked on it. And finally, I decided, this is, of course, when Stirp's peer-reviewed science was being published, right? And, and so I decided, I'm going to write this up and submit it to Current Anthropology, which is a, probably the world's most uh, foremost anthropological journal. And I'd had one article published in there, so I'd had some dealings with the editor. And I sent that article in. And about a few few months later, it came back, and he said he had eight reviews, four were positive, two were negative, and two were neutral. And so he didn't think he could publish it. And I said, but and he also sent the comments of the reviewers. And so I wrote back to him, I said, these comments are not fair, and here's why. And he reviewed it, and he said, yeah, so we're going to go with it. So he published that in Current Anthropology, along with a lot of, uh, they send for their major articles, they send out to like 20 or 25 scholars of different fields and different uh, points of view. They comment on it, and then I get to write a reply. So that was published in, in 1983. And that suddenly made me famous in the child world. Kind of undeserved, but because I was really writing on a lot of other people's research, I had just pulled it together, you know. So that's what really launched me. In 86... I decided, it, along with Rex Morgan in Australia, who had these marvelous full-size uh, reproduction photographs of some of Sturp's work, that we would have a, a, organize an exhibit in Hong Kong. So we got funding for that, and we also got funding to bring in some guests. So I brought in, um, we invited Ian Wilson, 
uh, Adler, Heller, and Ganella. So we had those four experts. And we also took, when that exhibit in Hong Kong finished very successful, we had like 100,000 visitors. And we gave conferences at Hong Kong U, Baptist College, and Chinese U. And then we took it over to Macau. So it just so happened that I didn't know this at the time. That was March of 86. But they were, it was beginning to brew a conference in Turin on the C-14 dating. And Adler was heavily involved in that. And so was Ganella, of course, as a scientific advisor to the Archbishop of Turin. So the fact that I had brought them to Hong Kong, paid their way, put them up in a hotel and all that, and um, that sort of ingratiated me with them. So I got managed finally to get invited to this conference in 1986 to consult and plan the C-14 dating. So that was a big, big event too. And it was um, right almost from the very beginning, even before it started, it was it was disappointing in some ways because I was told things by Giovanni Ricci, Ricci and uh, others that it doesn't seem, it seemed like things were already being decided before the meeting had actually started. Sterp was there, seven radiocarbon scientists were there, um, assorted uh, archbishop, uh, arch, arch uh, diocese people were there, and the Pontifical Academy of Sciences had about three or four people. So it was a big, big room with maybe 20, 25 people sitting around a square long table. Um, and it didn't really work out very well uh, in terms of the protocol that it designed, in spite of my and, and Al Adler arguing very strenuously against just a single sampling site. So that was um, a major sort of event in the in my shroud career. And ever since then, I've been trying to get that rectified. And how many years ago is that since 86? 30 something years more? <laughs> because that conference was what where it went wrong. And it went mm -hmm. wrong for several reasons. I mean, everybody was partly at fault, but more so than some than others, like the chairman of the, the president of the Pontifical Academy on the one hand with Gove, and on the other hand, Gonella, Lu Luigi Gonella, who was my friend, but he just took that uh, project and just ran with it. And he had no experience at all mm. in C-14 dating and wouldn't really listen. So that was um, a major, in, in fact, in my book, I go into that in some detail about how uh, that happened, chapter, by, you know, step by step up to, and then after the, the dating was, was published. And um, the next big deal we thought was the year 2000 a, a, a private conference private by invitation only organized by the archdiocese of turin again at um, what's called villa guilino this kind of resort just out outside of town and al adler again asked them to invite me and i was invited along with others it was sort of like a, a academic conference but also there was some intent to plan the future um, of shroud research and at the end of that conference, everyone was glowing. It was like wonderful. It was going to be a new, a new era. It was like Camelot, almost. They said, um, in fact, they sent out a letter at the end. Um, Guberti from the Archdiocese sent a letter saying, uh, quam bonum," you know, this quote from the Bible about how great and how wonderful, how joyful it is for brothers to get together and and have a good have a good time and a good meeting. And it turned out it was just totally disappointing in so many ways because right after that they did the restoration in 2002 and that was a real shocker that they would actually do that after all the talk about international cooperation and planning and so that's the other third of that's the last third of my book going through that whole process and what went wrong with the restoration so i mean that's sort of right ever since 2002 it's been like i haven't been that involved much in shroud research current research it's been sort of backward looking. Plus, I'm still up right at this moment trying to get another C-14 dating done. So um, to bring you up on that, I've in the past like 15 years or so, I've written a whole bunch of cardinals, mostly American cardinals, including Levada, Burke, Ravisi, Law, Pell, Dolan, Zen, Rigali, Stanford, Stafford, O'Malley, Harvey, and Farrell. The only ones that ever replied was Cardinal Burke, who was rather helpful, and Cardinal Pell of Australia, who wasn't helpful. And I think the reason he wasn't helpful was that he was already in some um, bad um, 
he, he was out of favor. Burke, of course, Colonel Burke is way out of favor. But all the others never even bothered to reply, even after I chased them with kind of shaming them, saying, come on, aren't you even going to acknowledge my letter and my request? Nothing. <laughs> so yeah. finally, this year, I got a cardinal that did reply. I won't mention who, I don't want to spoil it right now, but I'm hopeful, cautiously, that in our lifetime, we will see another proper C-14 dating of the trial. Well, that's uh, definitely necessary. I mean, the uh, uh, all the errors that were made in the 1988 carbon dating and all of the errors and how the sampling was done and all of that stuff is, uh, is just phenomenal. And uh, even after there was what appeared to be an agreed on protocol and how the sampling was done, then at the last minute, everything changed. So it was uh, kind, of, kind of fascinating. So uh, tell us a little bit about the background of uh, your, uh, your book, The Rape of the Turin Shroud. I'm in the middle of it. You mentioned the third part of it. That's what I've read primarily. And I'm looking forward to the, the first and second section because they're uh, I'm sure they're just as good. Well, right at the end of that, that book, there's a, a, a long letter that I wrote to the, um, the Turin, they call it now the Conservation Commission or the Turin Shroud Commission, pointing out all the things that had gone wrong. And it was very strongly worded. So after I wrote that letter, I thought, I might as well go ahead and put all this into a book because it's not going to, I'm not, I have not won any friends in pressuring all, all these years. I might as well lay it all out. Plus I had all this experience with the C-14 dating. So the first sort of the book is actually my article in current anthropology, which is a little bit outdated, but most of it still stands. So I put that in there as a kind of a general broad interest, sweeping introduction to the, to the shroud subject. And then I went through all the carbon-14 dating. I thought that all should be out there. And this is when nobody else had really written it from that perspective. Like I was at this conference and I engaged with these carbon-14 hotshots from the labs and also with Sterp. Sterp had sent three people there and uh, and with Ganella, who I'd met several times. So I thought eh, I should put all this out there for people to read and see what happened, at least from my... And then I read Gove's book, Harry Gove's book, which angered me so much i got i have to answer this some of the things that he said which are just total nonsense total totally ridiculous and his m maneuvering and manipulation and, and the things that he did secretly to try to torpedo the the proper planning and then torpedo sterp's uh, involvement in the c14 dating at all so all these things i hope i just need to get it all out there and um if i don't I, <laughs> I, I, can't, I don't see how I can make any more enemies, so I'll put it all out there. I couldn't get it published, by the way. I had to publish it myself. I had a New York publisher say, nobody's going to pay 20 bucks to read all this bad stuff about the Shroud. It, need, it needs to be more inspiring. So this is this is what I experienced, and I have to write it yeah. the way I saw it. Right? The, truth is, uh, strange, the truth is stranger than fiction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was really written for people who are interested in, in yeah. the background of yeah. these two, yeah. these twin disasters that the Shroud has mm. undergone. Mm. Yeah, there's no, no question about it. And, um, you know, it's, it was funny, or not funny, it's sad, I guess, when I was reading, you know, the, the third section in your book about the the difference between restoration and conservation, and why would... I, I, I'm really confused as to why someone would think that they'd have to restore which means, you know, getting rid of the faults and somehow, in my opinion, you know, getting rid of the faults and glossing over some of the, the cracks or whatever you might see in an artwork or whatever, as opposed to conserving it and keeping everything exactly the way it is so that it doesn't, you know, lose and degrade and in, you know, in the atmosphere or whatever that might happen to it. And I was just amazed that that somebody would think to take that kind of an action on a on such a valuable relic. Well, this is what restorers do. I mean, there is a, a chasm between restorers and conservators. And the conservative school of thought is basically passive restoration. So you, you passive conservation. Mm -hmm. So you remove any elements that might be affecting it. So putting it in a, in a low, very low oxygen environment, controlled humidity, controlled temperature, that's all great. Without light on it, you know, that's all great. But con restorers think in terms of a painting that's dirty, and that has cracks and that has smudges on it. So you want to clean it up. You might get look, try to get back to the way it looked originally, right? But even then, they didn't they didn't do that because they left. They took off the patches from 1534, which is a historical part of the trap. 
they removed the, the backing cloth and put on her own backing cloth. Flory Lomberg did. And this was like her, a backing cloth that her father had given her from, from Holland. But I don't, nobody, nobody would do that to a historical relic. I mean, if you had, say, a Roman temple with temp, Roman columns of a temple with medieval graffiti, you're not going to scrape out and sandblast away the graffiti from the Middle Ages. You leave it there. So it's just um, it's just appalling that they were or they were allowed to do this without, again, no objective, partial, impartial advice from people who didn't have a stake in it. They mm -hmm. all the conservation committee all had a stake in, and they were part of the restoration. The really sad thing is that Al Adler, who was on that commission, died before this happened. And then they tried to point fingers and say, well, Al Adler, Professor Adler approved us. He never did. He yeah. wrote a lot about how conservation needed to be, one needed to go step by step with proper research to, and, and proper consultation. He would never have allowed this kind of wild, invasive, mm. destructive intervention on the on the cloth. No. Well, it's so amazing. Um, you know, when I think about restoration, you know, you think about the, uh, you know, these wonderful paintings where you're trying to get the dust and grime off so you can see the original artwork. And, and uh, as opposed to, to your point, which I really like the term passive conservation. Um, so what do you think are the, the three biggest things that were really done to kind of, quote, rape uh, the Shroud of Turin? <laughs> only, and I don't know if you three. can only limit it to three, <laughs> but for the sake of time. <laughs> well, it's st starting with the, the, the way they approached it, they put lamps on the shroud and those lamps were shining for 16 hours a day while they're working. I mean, you just don't do that. And they didn't have filters. And even they have they they had um, Reverend Giberti giving a television interview. And the lamps are, are sitting there with nobody working, shining right on the cloth. I mean, it's just like, that's imp just totally unheard of to have that kind of light exposure. Secondly, well, there's so many, gosh, what's the, <laughs> not wearing gloves, not wearing hairnets, those kinds of things. But the one of the worst things they did was scrape away the, the deposits around the so-called poker holes or the L-shaped holes, which are probably, well, which do predate the fire of 1530. Too, because that evidence right there is in situ. It's evidence that has preserved for something that either burned it or fell on it. Some people have talked about um, some some ch charcoal or something from the the the, the uh, ceremonies that might have fallen on a candle. But that evidence is right there, and to scrape it away and put it in a bottle, it's lost its structure. So, and then after that, they did Raman spectroscopy on that area it's gone already um so this well, they stretched it they vacuumed it they vacuumed part of it all around the patches so these kinds of things i i just i can't even remember all the all the damage but so mm. many so much data was lost and unnecessarily so yeah. many opportunities that you know it's just um mind-boggling <laughs> yeah well i have a funny story to tell you because when i saw some of the pictures that uh, online from the Flory Lemberg book, and uh, and they're looking at it and they're touching it with their with their bare hands. They didn't have gloves on, so yeah. I have a uh, you can uh, you can buy a um, uh, a full length replica of the shroud. It's just a you know a cloth, and the the image is then imprinted on the on on the on the cloth. And I was going through the cloth on on TikTok, and I was touching it, you know, and I'm and. Uh, you know, and I'm saying right here is where the poker holes are and right here are the water stains and right here is then the, you know, the wound in the chest and whatever. And right. uh, it's, it's actually my, my, uh, my most seen, my most viewed TikTok video. And mm -hmm. uh, the comments that I get is that they, they, they go, oh my God, he's touching it. <laughs> And then I keep saying, it's, this is a replica, it's a replica, it's a replica. And they're still saying, you're touching it, you don't have gloves on. And when I saw them doing the same thing, and to your point about the lights, and then, I mean, these burn holes, those are critical pieces of, uh, you know, critical things that, you know, should never have, have, have taken place. Well, at the viewing, when we were invited to go there and view the new look crowd in, in 2002, Fred Zugaby was one of the ones who pointed out that um, they should have been wearing gloves. He said that directly to the mm. archbishop and the and the assembled uh, dignitaries from 
And um, her answer, Lauren Frey Lombard's answer was, as seamstresses and, and restorers, they need to feel the cloth when they're stitching it. And his response to that was, we do LASIK surgery, we do neurosurgery with latex gloves on. So if we can do that, you can you can sew a cloth. <laughs> and and pretty, pretty sharp terms. Uh, um, when we visited, to go back a bit to v Villa Gualino, we visited the cloth, uh, a, a special exhibition of the shroud for us. And it was on a board without the, any cover, mm. uh, mounted in a room without any lighting, just natural lighting. It was the middle of the day. And it was just like a wonderful experience to see that. And I was having so many so many things that I wanted to see and record on the cloth. And suddenly there's a bright flash from behind me. And I turn around and there's a guy that had like a, a Hollywood photographer, 1950s type flash attachment to his camera, taking a picture and big flash of light. And I went over to Al and I said, can you, can you stop this? And he said, no, no, this is a special presentation, their own thing. To, I'm not getting involved in that. And then a few minutes later, um, what's his name now? The guy who did the who saw the flowers on the ground, the Israelis, uh, botanist. Anyway, he was pointing out something to Paletto, and he got so excited they stepped over the cordon. We could get within one meter of the shroud, and there was mm. a cordon, a red mm. cordon, and you could that close to it in natural light. They stepped over. He and the cardinal archbishop stepped over, and he's pointing out something where he can thinks he can see a flower, and he suddenly took a pen out of his pocket and put it to within. Uh, like an inch of the cloth and I'm like, who would do that in when, whenever you're in a, in a library with any kind of manuscripts you're not even allowed to have pens you have to use pencils if you're taking notes mm. and he was that close to putting a mm. ink mark on the shroud these people this is bad bad omen for for conservation of the shroud and sure enough <laughs> it yeah. was only two years later that this horror took place yeah, it's uh, it is really amazing, and uh, and you know, thank you for putting it down on paper as to what exactly happened. Now you were though in the presence of the shroud. Tell us what that was actually like, without any of well, the interruptions and the flashing and stuff like that. Yeah, I wish there were no any. I, I was I was trying to focus on the blood stains because, to my mind, I'd seen the image so many times and I hadn't seen the blood up close and the real color. But I kept. I mean, I was looking at it and trying to absorb it as an archaeologist, but I was reacting, you know, so emotionally saying, wow, this could be the, the blood stain of Jesus, of Christ's blood from the side wound or from the nails in the palm. And at the same time, trying to digest it as an archaeologist, thinking, you know, is this, this is the way it flowed down the arm? Is that really possible? And then I was called away because there's a, there, were, there were people gathered around Cardinal Paletto, the Archbishop of Turin, and he wanted to ask me something. So you can't refuse the Archbishop of Turin, who's arranged this presentation for you. So I'm called away. And then as soon as I've answered a couple of questions in very clumsy Italian and reverting to French, he didn't speak English at all, by the way. I went back and had another five or 10 minutes trying to look, look at the wounds in the feet and, and then called away again. He wanted to ask another question. So it's constantly, you know, there was being pulled by all these, mm. you know, emotions as well as the scientific and analytical side, trying to, you know, absorb it all and and relate it, and see, you know, is this is this really the way it should look if he was nailed in the feet and the feet are crossed? Okay, you know, so it was a it was a time that was really too much, and it wasn't that long. It was maybe an hour, but it seemed to go by like that. And suddenly they said, "Well, we've got to go. We've got to go for mm. lunch." I mean, I would have stayed there for another two hours if they allowed us. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I, I mean, it, just to be in front of it and contemplate, it, uh, you know, and 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 then I, you know, the conflict that you had, so to speak, was just contemplating that you're in the presence of what is most likely the the burial cloth of Jesus Christ, and then on the other hand, saying, well, you know, archaeologically, how does this all come together? I can see your mind just flipping back and forth uh, when you're thinking about that. They had a very um, a, a moving sort of final closing, not exactly a prayer, but a reading from the Old Testament in Hebrew by um, can't think of his name, the 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 Israeli botanist. And it just escapes me at the mm. moment, but it was read in Hebrew, and then one of the Turinese people read it in Italian. So very moving, sort of the mm. to, to close on that note. But as we walked away, I thought, will I ever see it again? 
you know. We'll have a chance to see it again. Little did I know. Man, two years later, we would see it again, but mangled, I could say. I yeah. Mean, just so you saw it. You saw it pre-restoration, and then you also saw it post-restoration. Right. So to right. then, just curious, those poker holes that they look like they're pretty small, about the size of your finger. Um, are they much bigger now? Are they? Did that all change? How did what happened well, there? They slightly bigger. They scraped away around the the edge of each hole, and then any any quote. Any, any fibers that were loose, they scraped those away too. It was sort of like this is new, new in the new in the annals of textile restoration, where if it, if you pull it and it gives, just go ahead and pull it away. Because no. they were pulling away fibers oh. that were loose, so they wanted to you know get rid of the fray or the, the things that might you know crumble and come loose later. So those holes are enlarged. Yeah, you can compare the old photos and the new photos, but the worst is. The, the data that was lost that might have been there mm. and the same for the same for the all the burn holes that you know every single burn mark where it's charred when an image goes through it and or a blood stain goes into that area hello you still there yeah i sort of lost the picture hang on a second i, I hear you and i can see you can you see me no something going on here can you hear me, me? Let me figure it out Oh, there we go. I don't know what okay. happened there. Okay. Yeah. Um, every whenever an image area or a blood area intersects one of those burn marks where it's charred, you have an actual chemical transition right, right. there, which is important. Could could be very important right. to understand the image, what's going on in the image, or what the what's happening with the blood stain because there it's it's intersecting, but not immediately. It goes through lightly scorched to heavily scorched to charred so you've got a three-stage transition all within maybe mm. a centimeter mm. lost all that yeah. centimeter yeah. scraped away yeah. and it's now in a bottle where you everything's mixed mixed up yeah. so that i mean there's so many examples of data that was lost in this restoration well one thing i uh, really found interesting in terms of being able to prove the age of the shroud was what max fry did with the pollen and as I understand it, they actually vacuumed the whole cloth and removed any traces of dust and pollen that might have been, you know, of value at some point in the future. I haven't, I haven't been able to confirm that. I know that they did vacuum around those all the burn holes mm. because they were concerned about getting every every little speck of of carbon carbonized mm. material away from the cloth. They thought that posed a danger. In fact, mm. that was the main justification that they used, which is totally false. They said this carbon dust, which was collecting between the shroud and or the, under the patches and between the, the the cloth and the backing cloth, carbon dust deposits there. They call it dirty, solid, all this all mm. these words, which is just nonsense. They said that posed a threat to the health of the cloth, which is completely the opposite of the reality. The reality is, if that cloth had been just kept in a box for another few hundred years, say five hundred years. The only thing that would be left would be the charred portions. That's mm. what preserves the cloth over time, mm. because the rest of it is eaten away by bacteria, moles, whatever, um, fungus. So, charred cloth. I've excavated some charred cloth in Hong Kong, which has a horrific environment for anything organic to survive. Um, charred or touching a metal. Those are the two things that can preserve a cloth in yeah. these kinds of rough environments so they were totally wrong about that and any expert would have told them that's not a problem don't worry about that there are other things that can that you might want to consider but in in terms of removing some some of the patches to check under that or maybe removing the dust by careful vacuuming yes possibly but even then to remove the patches is also invasive why do it if it's not absolutely necessary and proven so is the shroud today, are those, uh, uh, are the Port Claire sisters patches from the 1530s, are they, have they, have they been replaced or is it now just a big empty hole? Well, they're all gone. And so is the backing cloth, a new backing cloth that's much lighter, mm -hmm. much brighter in color. Mm -hmm. So what you see is where the holes and the patches were now slightly brighter yellow sort of uh, appearance. So it But just from the right background. Here. It's just the background cloth. It's not like a new patch that's been no, sewn in. Then okay. no, no, no new patch. Just the, the new backing cloth. 
yeah. which was actually maybe 60 or 80 years old, but it's mm. still much, much lighter. And that also wasn't properly tested to, to, mm. to determine what was on it. Right. So it's right. something new that's been introduced to the, to the, the whole length of the cloth is now in contact with something new, which is just what, like foolish. Yeah. And how do you know on that new cloth, whether there's some, might be some chemical that might react with the, uh, the linen of the shroud that might actually degrade it faster. All kinds of things, yeah. you know, from yeah. fungi, mold, mildew. I mean, they say that they examined it, but was it thoroughly tested from mm. one end to the other? Was it maybe they dry cleaned it or something? <laughs> <laughs> well, and that yeah. right there is another chemical that, that is going to be. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So in your book, you talk about uh, some potential new uh, research proposals. Uh, tell us what you think needs to be done next. Well, of course, the carbon-14 needs to be done uh, with the highest priority because that is the thing that changed the reputation of the shroud globally. Mm. Before the C-14 was, was announced, when people knew that I was working on the shroud, they would always come up to me and say, tell us about the shroud. What's, what's, what's the deal on the shroud? It's very, very interesting. Now, instead of asking me, they tell me. Oh, it's mm. proven to be a fake. We know that now. Yeah, carbon right. 14. I say, Wait a minute. Hold on. <laughs> I know a lot about carbon 14. I did a lot of carbon 14 dating in my career and it, it ain't so reliable. It ain't infallible. That's um, in fact, in the new movie that uh, David Rolfe has produced, I changed one word in, in they were going to use a quote that I had in his previous movie. I don't know if you saw the one called the grave injustice. Yeah. He produced. Um, I had said something about it doesn't produce an absolute date. And I changed that in the literature that they were going to put out because absolute dating in, in archaeological terms is just as opposed to relative dating. That means stratigraphy mm -hmm. or pottery. Mm -hmm. Absolute dates is something that you get from a lab that gives you back an absolute date. But infallible, no, it ain't. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the primary thing for me. The image, the blood, there's lots of I mean, Sterp said it back in, I mean, Ray Rogers told me, or, or Barry told me, maybe, I forget who told me, when they had the Sterp two proposals in 1984, I guess it was, they said in, in, in 78, we went in with shotguns. Now we're going in with high-powered rifles and artillery because the advance in technology mm -hmm. and what they had learned then and how to address it in the next stage I mean, all that stuff is, is is beyond me in terms of, you know, the, the most sophisticated technology, but there's a lot now. And it would be extremely important to give scientists another few days with the shroud now. Yeah. We would have a lot of vast amount of new data. Yeah. But it's not going to happen or it's not going to make any difference until this question of radiocarbon age is sorted out. Right. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. it's going to be. Most people, it's already been decided what it is. Yeah. Medieval. And even though, you know, with some of the stuff with the uh, getting the the actual uh, statistical raw data from the labs, from the uh, British Museum and, and proving that there was a systematic error in the in the results and and uh, and then using that as now a way to identify potentially new new uh, research that needs to be done. But um, one of the things that gets me, though, is that on the on the uh, the radiocarbon dating is that it is destructive. So you actually have to cut you know away a piece of the cloth and destroy it to be able to get a uh, to get a uh, you know a result out of it. I think that's the the one thing that really uh, is hard to think about when doing any kind of testing on the shroud is how can you do testing that's not destructive. Well, you don't want it to be massively destructive, but. We, we did a proposal, Al Adler and I, and then uh, we pulled together a team of uh, textile expert and um, some uh, physicist, Larry Schwalbe was on that group and, and Ray Rogers. And we said, this is a, a cloth is 14 feet long and four feet wide. And what we need, this is before the, well, uh, b before and after the restoration, but before we said, what we need from the shroud is a piece the size of a Euro coin. That's one square centimeter, maybe two. Mm. And, there, there are well. That was when, of course, we, when we first proposed it, the patches were still in, in in place. That was way back in the in the nineties. But now that the patches are removed, you can see some peninsulas sticking out of of shroud cloth into the holes, like a tongue of material. And if that tongue was removed, it wouldn't affect the the mm. viewing of the shroud at all, mm. and it would give us just 
that uh, say two two euro coins or two one half dollar size coin two square centimeters out of a cloth that's 14 feet by four feet long that's an enormous large object to have such a tiny bit removed yeah. and the benefit that would be gained from it and like i always tell people even if the date comes back exactly the same it's it's still it doesn't prove it's not infallible it doesn't prove that the shroud is medieval but if the date comes back any different if it comes back 500 ad or 200 ad it's a totally new ball game mm. and it's a great win for everyone because there we we see that the shroud we we don't know what the real age is but at least we would have with that one tiny piece plus what they've scraped away those fibers the carbonized fibers can also be dated so two or three of those samples plus one taken directly. And recently, Turin, the Turin Scientific uh, Committee of the Chintro, the Turin Chintro of the Shroud, proposed to date those fibers that are scraped away plus the reserve piece that was cut in, uh, in 1988. And I thought, this is, this is not mm -hmm. going to work because yeah. the fibers that are cut scraped away have been locked away in the archbishops. And that reserve piece also locked away it has, there has to be one piece that comes from the shroud that is documented and seen, video, and the whole world sees that piece is taken yep. and dated, right? Yep. Along with the others to to get more data, of course. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. Although um, it, it would seem like if you took a charred piece of cloth, uh, you and I think you talk about that a little bit in your book, is that you don't know what other residual carbon might be in that charring that it could be from, you know, something else, the box that was burnt that it was in or something like that, that might also corrupt the results of the dating of the charred piece. Well, that's why when we drew up the revised uh, proposal that we sent in in 2015, I think it was to that uh, talk, talking about removing that one tongue of material, all the charred completely charred is already scraped away. Mm. So that's mm. in a, in a, in a vial somewhere. What's left on that piece is maybe lightly charred, that it's firm enough to resist the restorer's scalpels when they're scraping it, right, all the way to uncharred. So mm -hmm. with the material that is removed, plus the outer part of that, plus the inner part, you would have that transition yeah. from char to scorch to unscorch. So that would be a very valuable piece of dating to have three dates on those. If they yeah. all agree, fine. If they don't agree, it's telling you something about the yeah, effect right, of the right, fire. Right. Um, well, um, I just realized we're just about done in our time. I There's so many more questions I wanted to talk about. But um, yeah, so uh, anything else you'd like to mention about, uh, about the restoration, conservation, and the future of the shroud before we uh, close? Well, there's a, lot, there's a lot of scientists out there who could have a say in this that keep quiet. I don't know why. I wish they would chime in because with the church just needs to feel the pressure, I think, mm. because the, a lot of people want to see the truth of this, this cloth, this relic exposed and, and brought to light. And Ray Rogers said once there'll be hell to play when the truth comes out. Mm. He believed that they had not dated a piece that was not representative. Mm. So that's entirely possible. We need to find out. This is something that the church started this process and they just stopped it after 1988. They're like embarrassed or they, they yep. didn't handle it well. And somebody, some people in the Vatican are stopping this, probably high up, probably part of the Curia. And the reason why, who knows? Maybe they think, just leave it alone. It's done. We've done enough science, leave it alone. But this is anti unscientific, anti-scientific. It's like those clerics who refuse to look in Galileo's telescope. So we, don't, mm. we don't need to see that. And one guy who did, one priest who did look through it said there's nothing to be learned there and it gave him a headache <laughs> <laughs> well you know i look at it as... may still be <laughs> existing in the vatican today in some places yes well i look at it as uh you know the the jews wandered in the desert for 40 years and uh you know it kind of had to cleanse out the uh, the older generation so that the newer generation would have access or you know would be able to then thrive in Israel. Well, that's kind of maybe what's going on now is the the older generation. We've got to wait forty years before the the next round so we can get a whole new set of uh, new blood into the uh, into the scientific process. 
That's 40 years. That's still still quite a bit, quite a few years left. I hope you're not, <laughs> I hope that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> well, 1988 to uh, 2028. So it's only you know, five years. So, uh, you know, who knows, but, uh, That's anyway, uh, Bill, thank you uh, so much for uh, being on the podcast and, uh, and, and answering my questions that really, uh, you've been doing such a really important work to hopefully get some, a new round of study and testing and research done on the shroud in a, in an unbiased scientific way, as opposed to a, a biased way. Is there any way and anywhere that uh, people that might want to learn more about you or your book where they should, uh, where they should go? Well, I have a lot of writings that are available, not, not the book, but a lot of other writings on the shroud and archeology span and other subjects. They can, you can just Google William Meacham online bibliography and it'll come up. And all those that are listed there are downloadable. So you can read a lot, uh, uh, including some that were, that are, fairly fear ferociously attacking various people i didn't i said mean, let it all out let it all you out. didn't hold back at all <laughs> <laughs> well like i said in the book uh, the worst examples of crony one encounters cronyism and incompetence and backbiting and rivalry and that's just the pro shroud people <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that's right and we're all on the same side <laughs> yeah supposedly yeah <laughs> That's right. Well, uh, Bill, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And uh, for the audience, please stay tuned for many other videos in this seri series on the backstory of the Shroud of Turin. And please visit GuyPowell.com and sign up for more episodes. If you like this one, please rate it with five stars. Bill, thank you again. My pleasure. <laughs>